things. A term meaning to bring in by deceptive means. Wow. That sounds like a term that could adequately describe most sequels that come out these days now, doesn't it? Yes, I know, I constantly drone on about how awful sequels are. It's just like a bunch of tripe sandwiches while others constantly tease us like the glimpse of a bikini model through the window blinds, lulling us into the false security that uh, all sequels are absolute gold mines. Which explains why so many people try to jump on the bandwagon playing I'm sexy and I know it, trying to lure us in. And by the time we get to the theater, we find out that the only reason these people look sexy is because of the wonders of Photoshop and makeup artists. Find out that they have scurvy, their teeth have fallen out, and well, I think you get my point. Which brings us to the meat and potatoes of today's review. Hoodwink 2. Hood vs. Evil. For those of you who haven't heard of the original, I think a quick recap is in order. We take the well-known story of Little Red Riding Hood and completely throw so many twists and turns in it, it makes it strangely intriguing. Red Riding Hood is actually a freaking ninja. This Little Red Riding Hood's got a basket full of kick-ass. The Big Bad Wolf is a Fletch wannabe with a goofy caffeine-riddled squirrel. I don't drink coffee! Yeah, whatever. The Woodsman is actually an actor who longs for the day he can join the Happy Yodelers and Granny is actually an adrenaline junkie slash triple X knockoff that all come together to find out who's going around the forest stealing all the goodie recipes, of which Grannies are the absolute bestest in all the forest. Although why these awesome goodie makers businesses are instantly crippled when somebody takes their recipe book when, oh, I don't know, they should have had most of them memorized if they had been doing this for so long. Anyways, the baddie is caught, the special agent they brought in, who is from some agency they might have called the FBI in the normal world, but since we can't have this movie be too serious, they call it the Happily Ever After Agency, which recruits three of the four main protagonists, and it just leaves us dangling there, taunting us with a sequel that we thought and outright hoped would never come. And for a while I thought, oh good. They finally realized the values of self-restraint and realized that they couldn't really go anywhere with the sequel for this movie. And, hey, maybe we'll just go on and make something better, fresh, original, something that people enjoy. Like this movie. Then, as if someone with the most severe delay in hearing ever from Hollywood heard me, they rush out only six years later and rub this in my face and say, Haha, we made a crappy sequel, watch it like the mindless sheep that you are! So I went, and uh, even took my family to it, and, uh, you know, five minutes in, we realized that we had made a huge mistake, and we basically agreed that we would talk to no one about this, that is, until now. Oi! I'm seriously conflicted here, I mean, I enjoy going to movies, and really pleasantly surprised when occasionally they come out with something like this that works out so well. I mean, I feel like dated Star Trek Generations. Oh, yes! I hate this! It is revolting! More? Please. Hoodwink 2 has good intentions, but you know what they say about those, right? Well, Putting it off long enough. Let's get into it, okay? The movie begins by listing off all the main characters as if desperately attempting to say, Hey, look, we have all these huge names, so our movie can't possibly suck, right? Which should have been my first warning that this movie was absolutely going to suck. I had two initial thoughts as the credits rolled by. First, where are the witty subtitles that turn into advertisements about Norway and Moose from Monty Python? And second, where the hell is Anne Hathaway? I mean, okay, the first Hoodwink movie came out during Anne Hathaway's Sweet Girl phase. Princess Diaries, The Cat Returns, and Ella Enchanted. Now before she turned out to be another Disney whore. Oh come on, don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about. Britney Spears, Selena Gomez, Lindsay Lohan, the list goes on and on. And was no exception to this with The Devil Wears Prada becoming Jane and Valentine's Day. But she did go on to be Catwoman in The Dark Knight Rises, so I guess all is forgiven. Sorry, got a bit sidetracked there. Where was I? Oh yeah, Hoodwink 2. They replaced her with Hayden Panettiere, so I can't complain too much. It doesn't get much better. I mean, the laundry list of things that are wrong with this movie goes on and on. So I think I'll just try to tackle some of the bigger ones one by one. 
Otherwise, this review will turn out to be an epic two-hour episode. And I don't have the patience for that. Number one, the lip-syncing and voice acting. It rivals Final Fantasy X-2. The nerve! The nerve! I mean, it's like they didn't even try. Oh, wait. Number two, Nikki Flippers constantly complaining about mammals, which he screws up several times throughout the movie, such as when this helicopter crashes and then he parachutes out. Not sure if you got a good glimpse of your pilot, but it's a freaking bird! Birds are members of the Aves class, you groaning reptile! You mean amphibian, right? Whatever. And number three, the constant reference to jokes from the first movie. I mean, the first movie made it funny because they weren't constantly overused like they are here. Right off the bat, they bring out the joke about Twitchy speaking far too quickly to be understood without a translator. Twitchy normally speaks this fast and could be more or less easily understood. In the first movie, he was hyped up on coffee and you needed that translator. Now it's thrown in for cheap laughs, long worn thin. Next, they constantly assault Jedediah, the banjo playing goat from the first movie. It was like the director knew he was annoying and decided to get in on his own joke. Hey, you really hated that goat, didn't you? Yeah. Well, how about we get him beat up throughout the entire movie? Uh, how about no? But it will be funny. No, it won't. It's called beating a dead horse. Like I said, the list goes on and on. All right, the movie. So, Wolf and Granny surround the house with the Wicked Witch and Hansel and Gretel holed up inside with the plan of, I'm not quite sure, but one thing's for certain, we can't have somebody distract the witch while he, somebody sneaks in and saves them. Oh no, that's a horrible idea. Of course, that's exactly what Twitchy and the Wolf do, which somehow goes wrong, then the whole of the HEA shoots 20 rocket propelled tear gas grenades into the house. Oh, that's great, I didn't know it freaking isn't. Somehow, this has absolutely zero effect on the witch or the kids because screw logic. And the witch flies away on her rocket powered broomstick because magic in fairy tales is nonsense. It's all about the technology and science. The group falls after trying to catch up on a motorcycle. Granny leaps off the motorcycle and ends up getting captured by the wicked witch because she just happened to have a pair of handcuffs with her. The wolf tries to pull a granny but ends up crashing right into the windmill then utters one of the strangest lines. I've ever heard in a kids movie. Okay, I can taste my own butt. I, I can taste my, my own what? Okay, I can taste my own butt. He did. He did say what I thought he said. I did. I did tell a putty cat. What does that even mean? I, I can taste my own. I mean, okay, I understand. They can't sit, have people say, oh my, but. What, I, what kind of lie is that? that that's not possible. Or is it? Who the hell are you? Why, I'm Dr. Schadenfreude. And I brought science with me. Brought what? Science? Uh, I don't know if I want to be part of this. Why, it's very simple. We're going to test one of my longest twisted theories ever. Now. All I need is a volunteer! And a... <gasps> hmm, how about you over there? You know, for once, I think I'm going to agree with J-Ball here and sit this one out. Now, it's all very simple. I just need you to kick J-Ball in the die zone! No, 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 hold on for just a minute here. Oh. I can handle that. <coughs> oh. Oh. Now, um, what would you say that you're tasting right now? Maybe blood from the tip of my tongue? <laughs> why, why would you do that? <laughs> This is kind of fun. Maybe we should conduct even more experiments. <sighs> Love no more of that. 
I don't want to get my butt suit off. I don't think I could take another experiment. <gasps> Failing to save Granny, we cut off to the mystical mountain monastery where Red is training. Oh gosh. I can't even hardly make it five minutes without stopping. Must go forward. Must go forward. She's training to become an even better martial artist, but apparently has some trouble keeping her temper under control. Nobody calls me chicken. Red botches the delivery because that's still important for some reason. Like some cheesy Mr. Miyagi lesson that Red needs to follow, which will somehow teach her the mysteries of Kung Fu, or whatever it is she does. Then a completely stereotypical granny comes out telling her she's failed. While bemoaning her inability to control her emotions, Nikki calls Red and informs her of the news that Granny is now missing. Wondering why anyone would want to kidnap Granny, the leader of the Sisters of the Hood tells her the only reason anyone would want to kidnap Granny other than, well, you know, stealing her book of super awesome recipes, we get introduced to the super magical MacGuffin of plot devices, the Super Truffle! A truffle so powerful it makes anyone completely unstoppable. Of course, since it's so secret, sacred, and dangerous, they keep it in a super secure, awesome mountain vault that would make Richie Rich proud. Except, of course, the movie can't go on unless that was missing too! So you might as well erect a big neon sign over it saying, there's gonna be a twist! Obviously, this was in the kidnapper's plan to acquire Granny because only those who have made the trouble can know the secret ingredient. But that begs the question. If all the grannies of stereotypical nonsense knew the secret ingredient, why didn't the witch kidnap one of the more inept of the grannies? I mean... Like the white one who's got about as much brain power as a retarded snail. Guess that would be making too much sense now, wouldn't it? Red leaves before completing her training to go to help everyone out. You must complete the training. Oh, I can't keep the vision out of my head. They're my friends. I gotta help them. Even though she's not ready. Yeah, I know. Stupid! You're so stupid! Meeting back up with Wolf, who she still has a distaste for, even though I thought they buried the hatchet at the end of the first movie, but whatever. They go to shimmy down Jimmy Ten Strings for information about all these ingredients that are being ordered by the villain. Why they couldn't, oh, track down the building, put surveillance on delivery vans, or uh, I don't know, raid the building with your massive HEA force is beyond me. Well, actually not, because we've got to make the point that we're in a fairy tale land with tons of fairy tale characters, like the giant from Jack and the Beanstalk. So of course they go with this option and fumble another disguise attempt, and somehow learn that the bunny from the first movie is placing orders for these ingredients, even though he's locked up in an asylum, and should be locked up from all the outside world completely, but again, screw logic. So they figure out what they should have known already, since the HEA agents were constantly surrounding the building, but doing jack all, that Granny is in Dark Tower's castle, which is the only creepy, ominous, obviously a bad guy hideout in the history of all movies. I'm surprised they didn't put on a fake thunderclap and lightning strike while they revealed this dang thing. Granny somehow gets free and tries to save the kids, but it turns out that the kids were actually the real masterminds behind this. Not even halfway through the movie! Double twist! Yeah. Red tries to go rescue her herself, but fails miserably. The wolf, having gone off to mope for a while, somehow gets motivation to come back into the agency, rescues Red, and they finally figure out that they need to work as a team. Really? He needs to almost die by being blown up by Cheech and Chong Marin as the three little pigs to figure out going solo is a bad idea? Right. So, they enlist the help of Kirk, who they've only been hinting out through the entire movie that, hey, I still exist, to break into the building with his happy yodlers, who want to be the A-team so bad it burns in their itchy woolen lederhosen. They break into the castle, hold the pigs at bay, while Wolf and Red use the same tired fake beards to sneak into the facility, and this time, nobody suspects them of actually being fake, even though a little girl is wearing a full old man beard! Seriously? These guys' prop budget falls to the floor in this movie? And don't even try to explain how that makes sense in a CG movie. I mean, using the same costume over and over, expecting a different result, and I wonder how that even works. Mm -hmm.
Who's there? Uh, yes, good afternoon. Um, I'm from the Department of Health and Safety and uh, came to inspect the building. In particular, this room has got a lot of fire hazard potential. Not to mention that whoever lives in here has got a serious Otsaku problem. Oh, really? I do have a problem, don't I? Maybe it's because it's all your stuff, isn't it, J-Bob? Oh, come on. How did you see through my clever disguise? Oh. Oh, man. Can't believe this disguise didn't work. I mean, it's absolutely foolproof. Oh. Oh. Now, there is an idea. This time, I've got to do it with lots of can do and wishful attitude. Go do this again. Eh? Oh, I wonder who that could be. Couldn't possibly be J Bob again now, could it? Uh, yeah, I'm here from the the Daily Planet, and uh, couldn't help but notice that your newspaper subscription is about to expire. Thought you might like to to get that renewed. Oh yes, I don't want to miss out on the world's events now, do I? Where do I sign? I love those moments. I like to wave at them as they pass by. Who is it? Oh yeah, the movie. So, Red gets into the kitchen, suddenly realizes what the secret ingredient is, even though she's had no additional training and has not improved in any way. Hansel and Gretel come in, summon the Lord of Darkness to celebrate their success in creating the Super Truffle, and Red fears all is lost. Until Granny gives her this nugget of advice. A person can never really fail unless they give up. Really? Winning is good! Losing is bad. Pro tip, don't get beaten up by Andy Dick. And what does this super all-powerful truffle actually do? It turns them into super-sized brats that can level cities. Oh, wow. They just ran out of ideas, didn't they? How much time left? Hmm. Say about ten minutes. All right, let's wrap this up. The AGA comes to stop Hansel and Griddle, all 20 of them, but they're completely useless. So it's up to the original four to save the day. They knock the truffles away from the kids, but then they get them back by teasing Red, Marty McFly style once again, trick the kids into blowing up like beach balls by eating all of the truffles at once, rendering them completely useless, and then Wolf and Red peel out Starskin Hutch style, not before leveling the goat. Once more for good measure, because that wasn't completely old and tired yet. So yeah, that's Hoodwink 2. Don't know really what I was expecting, other than uh, everyone that went and saw this thing was a complete sucker. All the nonsense I brought up barely even covered half of it. Yeah, it's an hour and a half of inconsistency, countless movie references. I mean, the whole science of the lamb scene is just what little kids need to be asking their parents about. Hey, Mommy? Yes, sweetie? Who's, who's Clarice? Why is that buddy tied up to that chair? Well, you see, it's about a homicidal maniac who's actually quite a brilliant genius and somehow drugged some guy up to convince himself to eat his own brain. What? And you wonder why our society as a whole is messed up. I mean, where do you think kids get these ideas? Turned out to be complete wackos. I mean,. Okay, I realize that not everyone who watches a movie like this is a complete thicky, and since they see something, like a murder or somebody shooting a gun, is like, I must kill people now! I mean, that's retarded, but... 
The idea doesn't just come out of nowhere, okay? Have to get it from somewhere. Shut up, Meg. I agree. It's just this movie is so ridiculous. It's, it goes nowhere. It's beating a dead horse, and I've had about as much as I can have from this one. Congrats to the actors who put up with this movie. And hope they go on to make much better things. <sighs> Can't really say that much for the director, though. I mean, I never thought this was a good idea. Seriously needs to be sat down and have a stern talking to about what he has done with his life and hopefully give him some ideas to change what he's doing. Of course, if he, he doesn't want to, we could always have Dr. Lecter talk to him. Now, I want you to imagine something with me. Imagine a world where sequels are banned. Would this not be a beautiful place? Sure, we'd miss out on genuinely good sequels like Thief 2 or Half-Life 2, but I think that's a small price to pay. Every story would have to be fresh, so the writers would have to work extra hard to make the characters relatable. With no sequels, there are no franchises, so there'd be less fandom, so all the nerds will go off and become doctors and scientists and rid the world of all known diseases, and best of all, endings would have to have some closure. Under this regime, ending the game with ambiguous to be continued it's when you have no idea if you'll even make a sequel will be punishable with prison time. And even if I do, I'll jump your bike right off of your roof. Yeah! Cause if I crash real bad, your sister will think I'm real. Okay, I can taste my own butt. Okay, I can taste my own butt. Okay, I can taste my own butt.